thing you were talking about, so I figured I'd come up. Good morning, church. Some morning encouragement for you from the book of Psalms, Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Who has clean hands and a pure heart? Who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false? He will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God his Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O your gates. 
Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. Selah. Let's stand and sing a Hosanna.
The same as crown him with many crowns. The sentiment is the same. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. We're just singing four verses of crown him with many crowns. Let's have everybody sing verse one. Uh, let's have the men sing verse two. The ladies sing verse three. And we're all together on the last verse. Crown him with many crowns. that we have a God we can celebrate, that we can be excited about. I pray, Lord, that that would be true in our lives, that uh, not just here in this place when we're all together, but in the lives that we live every day, I pray that we would go in excitement, in joy, in, in knowing the creator of the universe, the King of kings and Lord of lords. May we speak your truth with boldness and with love. Guide us as we live these brave lives of love and obedience and guide us as we pray together. The way you taught your disciples to pray when you taught them. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debts. Please be seated. Right, amen, right? Crown him the Lord of all. That one, uh, I have a... Um, a playlist of some hymns, and one of them is a new version of, um, a, a, a new, probably about 1990, um, and then halfway through it, they sing just a chorus of Crown Him With I almost feel like I should just stand up wherever I am and, and salute or whatever. It's just so inspiring. Thank you, Glenn, and the praise team, both of those songs. Um, remind us that we are at Palm Sunday. And Palm Sunday is a, um, 
a reminder to us that it's very easy to miss the point. It's very easy to miss what Jesus is trying to say in his, uh, in his message. We just prayed, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And in Palm Sunday, they are saying, our kingdom come, our will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so we're going to look at that, and we are going to uh, read this morning from uh, Mark chapter 10, I mean Mark chapter 11, the uh, Mark version of the triumphal entry. Before I do that, I have a number of announcements to uh, explain what's going on this week. We have the um, uh, Holy Week, Passion Week is this week, and we have a service on Thursday night at 7 p.m. It's a Monday Thursday service. If you're not familiar with a Monday Thursday, what that even means, you're not alone. As you were singing, crown him with many crowns, you might have hit some words you didn't know what they mean. Ineffably sublime, right? Get your dictionary out, look them up. It's awesome. It means he's awesome beyond whatever you could imagine. Um, so uh, Monday Thursday was, all, as I've said before, is always one of those ones that like, what in the world is Monday Thursday? And we'd go, with, you know, as a family, we, I grew up in a family, we went, if the church was open, we went. And uh, Monday Thursday is just, Monday is the Latin word for mandate. And Jesus gave a new mandate on the Thursday night before he was crucified. And that is that we love one another as he has loved us. And so we celebrate that a mandate. It's a command. And that's, he says, how we'll know we are his followers if we love one another. And if we wash each other's feet in how, whatever version that means in today's society, uh, today's culture, we're literally not washing each other's feet. Some churches do ceremonies of that, but Jesus, I think, is saying something even deeper than literally washing someone's feet. So we celebrate that Thursday night. Um, Saturday, we have the pancake breakfast and the Easter egg hunt. The pancake breakfast is for all are invited. The Easter egg hunt is for kids um, and me. We charge. It's like the Oklahoma stampede when they open that gate. Um, so uh, 9.15, pancakes, and uh, then we'll meet up here to just get everything ready for across the street, and we'll have the Easter egg hunt. It's always a, it's always a fun time. It's a great community-building event, and what we want you to do is if you have nieces, nephews who have kids, if you have grandkids and you're trying to get one foot in, that's a great time to do it. And so well, here's some connections. Let's make some friendships. Let's, 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 let's start the process there. Uh, Short-term missions offerings. We have two groups going. Um, we have the young adults going in June to Belize and the, uh, and the teens going to um, uh, Michigan. I'm going to remember that one of these times. Michigan in July. And as you were aware, last week Ainsley came up and said that we're, she's doing a bake sale. And she gave me this as a reminder. Thank you for supporting the CBC 2024 missions trip. Um, the North Bakery. Is that an official bakery? Where's Karen? Is that an official bakery? All right, so uh, they're not free. You need to donate something, and you'll get something delicious. I've already put my order in for a Boston cream a pie, and so I'm excited about that already. Um, also, on Sunday morning of Easter morning, there is a, um, you can see in the notes that there, are a, there is a um, sunrise service. We hold it across the street. Richard uh, Schumann runs it. And then we'll be meeting here on, um, that's 7 a.m. And then obviously we're meeting here next Sunday for Easter. So it's a, it's a very important time of year, but it's also a really good time of year where people who normally won't go to church, this, this can be a time to invite them. So uh, please keep those in mind. We are reading from Mark, uh, Mark 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage in Bethany in the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. And just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why you're doing this, tell them the Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there Asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. 
Jesus entered Jerusalem, went to the temple. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus, and we shout, Hosanna, in the highest. You are the only one who saves. You're the only one who brings victory. Help us not to get this backwards, Lord. I pray with all our heart, Lord, that we do not say, our kingdom come. And I pray for anyone in here that, who is struggling, Lord, that they will know that when you enter into them, everything changes. And I pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. All right, children, come forward for the children's. All right. Okay, you guys, any of you guys play an instrument? You do? What do you play? Don't. No? I play the drums. You play the drums? You play nothing? I promise I will never play music. You promise you never play music, ever? <laughs> ever? Yeah. Okay, never, ever. ever. You play any uh, instrument? Okay. All right, well, you know that Mr. Hall, he, uh, he's really good at the guitar, but he does something, I'm assuming you do, right? Every time he plays, he gets his guitar out and he uses this. Anyone know what this is? A chord? It's a, it's a guitar tuner. Guitar what? Tuner. I was going to say tuna. They told me don't say that. Guitar tuna. Right? It's a guitar tuna. Right? And, uh, no, you say right there. And, uh, <laughs> and what he does is sometimes the strings on the guitar get a little too loose and he puts this next to it and, and he knows how to tighten up the strings just right. But sometimes the strings actually get too tight and he puts this next to it and it, he knows, use, uses this to find out where it loosens and get the strings looser. Because he wants to get them just right. And when you listen to him, it sounds great, but he puts some work into it ahead of time. And he gets out his guitar tuner and he tunes it. You know, it's just. <laughs> and I'm going to keep telling you guys this. I'm never going to stop telling you that you need to. You're never going to stop saying cartoon too? Read God's word. It's like, it's, it's better than a guitar tuner. Sometimes we get too tight. Sometimes we get too tight. God's word says loosen up. Cartoon. And sometimes we get too loose and God's word says tighten up. But we won't know that on the guitar unless we do what? Sometimes we try to play it by ear, and he probably can, because he's so seasoned. But, yeah? Yes. I'm almost done, don't worry. So what are you going to ask? Okay. All right. Um, these are like the same thing. And you know what this always points us to? Jesus. So when you go down, you're going to get one of these. Pops. So I have a little challenge for you. See if someone can teach you how to turn one of these into one of these. I can do that. Because all things should always That's point to, you can do it? Yeah. Well, after church, I'm going to check. Yeah. Okay. I'll do it. Don't do it during Sunday school. Pay attention to your teacher. I'll all right? But that's what the Bible always does. It tunes us. No, I, I, I don't need one. I've ever got one. <laughs> Father, thank you for these children. I pray, Lord, that they become children of your word. I pray that we as a church, parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, family, friends, we always point them to your word, which will always point them to Christ. And I thank you for them, Lord. Cover them, anoint them, surround them, Lord. Protect them from decisions that can lead to harm so that they are ready when you call them. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Go ahead. Again, good morning. Um, I'm going to ask you guys a question that I know the answer to. But have you ever completely missed the point on something? Completely missed it. When I was in high school, I tried to be a good student. I, I'm just going to go off on a little tangent. I, I, teaching, I've taught for over 40 years now. I know. It's a long time. I've always been surprised by kids who, who don't want to how do I put this, because it sounds weird as a teacher saying, impress the teacher. I always kind of had that inner drive that I wanted the teacher to think that I was doing, you know, know that I was doing well and trying. And so one year, in, as a senior in high school, I was in an English class, 
And I was given an, we were all given assignments. We had to choose a historical character and write about them. And I chose Machiavelli. And I prepared the life out of this report. I even made fake swords out of cardboard and wrapped them in um, duct tape, gray duct tape, and, and had a fellow classmate of mine do a mock sword fight. And I put a lot of work into this report, and I was very pleased with it. And I had a good English teacher, Mrs. Kenny. I don't know if any of you guys went to Old Weymouth High, Mrs. Kenny. And um, she took me aside afterwards. She said, Mr. Dagley, that was a very good report on Machiavelli, but you completely missed the point. Machiavelli is really known these days for one thing, writing the book The Prince, and there's Machiavelli in politics, and it's about kill, work your way up to the leadership, and everything like that. And you gave a passing mention of the book. The whole point anyone would choose Machiavelli to study in the first place was because of everything you missed. And she said it nicer than that, but I got the point. I was like, I studied the life out of it. I really, I, was, I, I liked her as a teacher and I wanted to impress her. And I missed the whole point. And that's what's going on in, on Palm Sunday. These people are entirely missing the point. And when you miss the point spiritually, and you tweak scripture to meet your needs spiritually, Love can turn to hate very quickly. And we're experiencing that in our culture today, where kids that have gone to church and have been taught the word, and suddenly are not agreeing with the word, are hating Christianity, are leaving Christianity. Because, and, and I have to be blunt about this, because it doesn't match their idea of what the message of Jesus should be. And when Jesus is coming through that gate and he's waving on that donkey, I don't know if he was waving, I don't know what was going on, right? But he's coming in and they're throwing palms and coats and Hosanna. And this is on a Sunday. And then on Friday, they want to kill the same crowd. A lot of the same crowd wants to kill him. I, he knows that ahead of time. He knows he's going to Jerusalem to die. He knows that one who is throwing the coats on the ground is the same one who's going to yell and crucify him five days later. Why? Because they want Rome overthrown. They think he's coming in as a military messiah and going to return Israel to its former state. Blessed is he who comes. The kingdom of David they're talking about. What kingdom is that? In the time of David and Solomon, the Israel was at its greatest in military, money, um, praise, whatever, and they want to be restored physically to that state. And they think, here he comes. He's just raised Lazarus from the dead. That's the stressor. You know, every, every uh, crime show you ever watch, what was the stressor? What caused it to flip? Well, Jesus is going along, he's going along, and suddenly everything changes in John chapter 11 when he raises Lazarus from the dead. And it changes on both counts. Now the leaders want to kill him, and now the people think, if he can raise Lazarus from the dead, he can overthrow Rome. And now he comes to three miles from Bethany. He's coming in, and they have it so wrong. And, and I preached a sermon um, in the summer called Better Than the Mistake, because this is where I'm going with this. There's a few verses in the Bible that are better than the mistake. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. The mistake is we think that that means we can conquer every mountain. What Paul is saying is I can go through every valley and mountain. I can go through it. And that's better. 2 Corinthians 10.5, take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. And if you read the context of 2 Corinthians 10.5, it's thoughts, the things that have captured our children. We can take them captive and bring them obedient to Christ. But we always say, in my mind, that's the mistake we make. We think it's in our mind. It's better than that. Because if he can take captive those thoughts, he can take captive these thoughts. The big picture is always better. And Jesus has come not to overturn Rome. That's a temporary victory. He's come to give an eternal and internal victory. That's where he's come. And so we're going to take a look at this. And, and if you're visiting, uh, let me tell you, I've been going through the life of Christ in chronological order. And we are now in Matthew 5, where he's preaching the Sermon on the Mount. 
And at first I was going to veer off and say, okay, Palm Sunday, Easter, veer off and get into Palm Sunday and Easter and then get back to Matthew 5. And then as I'm reading Matthew 5 and as I'm reading any part of the Bible, I say every point of the Bible points to Jesus Christ, points to Easter, points to Palm Sunday. And not like I have to make this work somehow. It works. I started reading this passage. Well, turn with me to Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 20, where we were going to be next. And it is Palm Sunday. And I'm not trying to jam a round peg into a square hole by doing this just to make it work. It says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Not should not, cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. So in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and of the teachers of the law, you'll certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. And you read that and you go, what does that have to do with Palm Sunday? Well, I'm going to tell you, they have continually mistaken what it means to be in the kingdom of heaven and why Jesus has come. Even to the point where, well, you're going to get rid of the law, right? Well, let's look at this. Let me pray and let's look at this. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. And I pray for your authority to take over right now. May your words, Lord, be heard this morning. In Jesus' name I pray this. Amen. All right, so what does this have to do? Well, we have to go back to the end of last week's sermon, which was the end of the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount has multiple explanations. If you want the notes from last week, I have no idea where they are. Someone might have them, right? <laughs> and, uh, and I've read the Sermon on the Mount. Every person eventually falls in love if they're seeking God. They fall in love with the Sermon on the Mount. And they just read it, and then they want to read it again, Matthew 5 through 7. And there's something about it that just grabs you and confuses you, and makes you wonder, maybe frustrates you, because you're like, I can't do this. I remember as a, as a, a young uh, college kid reading the Sermon on the Mount and reading the part, you know, don't hate and don't lust, the verses that we're going to get into the next couple of weeks, and thinking, well, that's impossible, right? And I'm like, is Jesus just trying to set a bar to frustrate me? And then I remember even Paul's words where it says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Do not frustrate them. Jesus isn't trying to frustrate us. So I had to say, okay, since he's not trying to do that, I've got to read deeper into this, and it led me down a good path of the Holy Spirit. But before I get there, uh, next week and the week after, um, what about the salt and the light? So I read it again in the context of the end. The end explains to me the Sermon on the Mount. And at the risk of repeating last week's sermon, I'm going to say it again because I think it helps. At the very end of the sermon, Jesus says, anyone who puts these things, who hears these things and puts them into practice will be like the one standing on a rock. And when the storms hit, and then he gives three directions that the storm hits, the rain falls, the wind blows, and the waters rise, your house will stand. Anyone who doesn't, when the same storm hits, will fall. And I think to myself... That, he's saying the point of the whole message there, and what's the point? The point is the storms hit everyone. The rain falls on everyone. And like I said last week, we live in a world where there's cancer. We live in the world where there's financial ups and downs. And everybody's involved in the swamp of that, because we all live in the swamp. We all live in the groaning creation of Romans 8. We live in it. It's a broken world, and we live in it. And just because you're a Christian, God doesn't bubble wrap you and say, there you go, you'll never get touched. Sometimes Christians get hit really hard and they don't understand it. And I, and I look at the end of the Sermon on the Mount and I say, what is he telling me? He's saying, if I systematically let go of hate, if I systematically let go of lust, 
if I systematically let go of the praise of man, the need for personal vengeance, the need for an eye for an eye, if I let go of anxiety over the things of this world, if I let go of putting myself in the judgment seat, if I let go of these things one at a time and really let go of them when the storm hits, because it will hit me, he says, and it will hit me from all directions sometimes, I will not collapse because I'm not holding on to them. The only time it brings me pain is when I'm holding on to something so tight and the storm hits and I can't believe I have to let go of it or it's being ripped out of my hands and there's pain. But if you're going to follow the Sermon on the Mount, you are the freest person that walks on this earth. And, and I'm convinced of that. We'll go through that over the next few weeks. It's an emancipation proclamation for a Christian. That's what the Sermon on the Mount is. And so what does salt, light, and the law have to do with that? Well, first of all, he says, you are the salt of the world. And there have been books written on the many meanings this could be. I've taught for years a New Testament class. And every year I say to the kids, it's a 10th grade class, and I say, what does salt do? And they all have different reasons for it. Flavoring. In those days it was a uh, pres preserving. You preserve things in salt. In those days it was also currency. You would use salt to make exchanges and all these things. I don't, okay, you're going to hate this, what I'm going to say. I don't know exactly what he's mean by salt, but I will tell you one thing. Have you ever jumped in the Atlantic and all of a sudden realized, I did not know I had a cut right there, right? You're like, whoa, I didn't know I had a cut right there. Oh, I didn't know that there was any hurt in the salt. One thing I'll tell you about salt, it reveals. It reveals. It reveals the problem. But another thing about salt is eventually it leads to where the healing can take place. See, the point of healing needs to find the point of pain, the point of sin. One of the reasons I love Isaiah 6 so much is when Isaiah 6 starts with King Uzziah dies, and he was the longest reigning king ever in Israel. So he was some sort of protection system. You know, if you have something that covers you for years, right? Have, if, if you've ever lost a parent, there's a, there's a feeling of something there, like my covering is gone. My covering is gone. Uzziah dies, and all of a sudden uh, Isaiah is brought into the presence of God with the light shining so bright, he immediately stops and says, whoa. I'm a man of, oh, I hate her. <laughs> now, that wasn't Ruth. <laughs> that was Siri. He says, I am a man of unclean lips. I am a man of unclean lips. He gets very specific. And it says, the angel goes and plucks the coal out of the fire and touches his lips. I can't get over how clear that is to me, how specific I have to be, and how when I open the word and it reveals, the salt reveals exactly where the problem is. We try to deny problems and justify our personality. That's just who I am. I'm a jokester. I'm bitter. My family's bitter. That's just who we are. My family's sarcastic. That's just who we are. We're a family of warriors. That's just who we are. And then the light shines, and all of a sudden it's like, no, salt on the wound. This is a problem. And when the light shone on Isaiah, he said, I am a man of unclean lips. And the holy, those angels touched him on, took the healing coal and touched him on the lips. Because the point of pain is the point of healing. Now, that may not be what Jesus is saying, but when I hear you are the salt of the earth, one of the things, I hear all those other things, and that's fine, but I also hear you need to Stand on the word because that is the salt in this world. That is revealing people, pain, the problem. And you can't be healed unless you confess that there is a problem. And then he says you're also the light of the world. And that light can't help but shine. It is who you are. He says the light will shine. So I think what he's getting at is a lot of what the misunderstanding of the Palm Sunday is. My kingdom come, my, you know, fix my roams in my life. Take off the roams of my life, my financial situations, my physical situations, my relationship issues. Take away my roams. They're oppressing me. And Jesus is saying in the Sermon on the Mount, I will heal you from the inside so that when the, the roams hit, you won't collapse under them because they will hit. There will be roams in your life. There will be catastrophes. You live in a broken world. And I'm not bubble wrapping you and sending you to heaven. 
You're going to live in that broken world. But to live in that broken world, you've got to be salt. You've got to be light. And if you start ripping up, now to the next part of it, and if you start ripping apart the word, and removing what you don't like because it doesn't match my kingdom come, then you have lost your saltiness and you are worthless. And there are churches that are taking parts of the word out. We don't like this because it doesn't match what we think the kingdom of Christ would look like because he's a God of love. And why would he not love? And you're like, I can't stray from this. It, it, you probably picked it up by now, but almost every other children's sermon is me just pleading with you to not drop the word, to teach the word to these kids, because it's the life changer. I, I, Jesus says, you know, the devil wants to remove the details, and, I, and we've heard the saying, the devil is in the details. Well, I'm going to tell you a different saying. The devil removes the details. Sanctification is in the details. Sanctification, the deeper you go, the deeper the word reveals things to you. And, and I could guarantee, if you've been Christian for 20, 30 years, I guarantee this, because it's true in my life. There are things that bother you that never would have bothered you, even when you got saved. Because God is narrowing the focus. And all of a sudden, you're like, big picture. I, I've said this before. You, you flip on a light in the basement, and you're like, ugh. And you just start removing big stuff. You don't even look at the little stuff. It's meaningless to you because you've got to get the big stuff out of it. There's a joke in there about me. Ruth usually removes me from the basement first. <laughs> but then you get the big stuff out and you go, oh, that. And you get that out and you go, oh, that. You get that out and then you're like, oh, that. You know, you get the analogy. And some of you are still dealing with some of the big stuff and you should focus on it. This has been a... Uh, uh, an issue in my life that has got to come down. But once it comes down, you're going to notice smaller ones, the details. And someone in your life will say, I've had kids say, Miss Dagley, why do you care so much about that? I go, I wouldn't have 30 years ago. But as God has refined me and opened more things up in the word, more and more I've been bothered by things that never would have made sense to anyone. It wouldn't have made sense to me 30 years ago. And that's okay because we're in a progression of faith. And we get these aha moments. And Jesus says, if you remove even a punctuation point, if you even remove a punctuation point, a jot or a tittle, the young adults a number of years ago used to make fun of me because I used that phrase a few times. And they said, you should name your kids jots and tittles. And I said, I don't like any of the sound of that. And, um, and it's Luke 17, 1. Then he slams the teachers. And if you teach others that, and very quickly, I'll just read it. Luke 17, 1 says, you know, hey, things that cause people to sin are going to come in the world. Luke 17, 1. But woe to the person to whom they come. I use that at school sometimes when I'm disciplining a kid. Mr. Dagley, that's, everybody does that. You brought it. Yes. Things are going to come into this world. You better not be the one that brought it. Things enter into your churches. You better not be the one that brought it. Woe to the one that brings it. False teachings are going to come to this world. You better not be the one that brought it. That's what Jesus is saying back in the Sermon on the Mount. People are going to start ripping apart the word. And you say, well, are you just a legalist? No. You, no, the opposite. I want freedom. But I know that freedom is found in the details. See, Jesus is not saying, okay, I'm going to wrap you guys up in rules. Jesus is saying, I'm taking off the bondage. I'm removing the bondage of hate. I'm removing the bondage of lust. These are all bondages. I'm removing the bondage of the need for personal praise when you pray or give or fast. I'm removing the bondage of, I got to get back at them. I'm removing these bondages. I'm not putting bondages on you. I'm taking them off of you. So when the storms hit, you're free. And we get it backwards. And it's in the details. And there's a great story that, uh, that really helped me because I think it parallels my life a little. I'm not comparing myself to Josiah. But I think that um, we have a, um, a few things in common. It's always dangerous when a teacher says, I'm like David. Well, yeah, you know, maybe the bad parts. Um, so Josiah, if you, you know, I put them in here just so it's easier. So you're reading through the book of, Josiah, of, of 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles, and I have to kind of put them together because the story kind of goes like this. 
the parallel stories with different angles on them. And so this is this young kid. He's eight years old and becomes king. His name is Josiah. And listen to the story if you're struggling with a young person in your life that you think should be further along than they are. You might want to give them a little slack. So he's eight years old. He becomes king. And I'll just sum it up. And then in Second Chronicles, it goes through his chronicles of his development. His personal event. And then it says, in his eighth year, he began to seek God. So he's 16 years old now, and he's like, I'm going to seek God. Then it says, in his 12th year, he began to do a house cleaning. So now he's 20. And he's like, I'm going to get, I got to get stuff, this stuff in the kingdom. I got to get rid of it. Right? And that's a typical progression of, of a kid, of a new Christian. Forget a kid of a new Christian. I, I want to seek God. And then a couple years later, well, then i got to get my life right. And so he starts clearing things out of the temple. And then in the clearing out of the rubble of the temple, this famous story of Hilkiah the high priest finds the law. It has been gone. It has been buried in the rubble of a temple, of the temple of God, for years. And, in the, and he's 26 years old when this happens. And, he, and all of a sudden, the priest comes to him and says, look what we found. Look what we found. Oh, look what found us. I like to think if you hunger and thirst for God, he will progressively lead you to his word. That's what I believe, because that's what happened to me. This is a personal story for me, because I think this is what happened to me. i gotta, I got to get my life right. I believe you. I'm 16 years old, and I believe in you. I, I do. Uh, 20 years old, not the exact ages, but you get where I'm going with this. i, I, I got to get some stuff out of my life. 26 years old, the word. He just brings me to the word. And the ever-increasing intensity of 2 Kings 23 is worth a read on its own. Because all of a sudden he finds the word, and it's like the gas pedal is hit. And all of a sudden, I'll just read a few of them. I put them down there. 2 Kings 23, 13. The king also desecrated the high places that were kept east of Jerusalem on the south of the hill of corruption. The one Solomon, king of Israel, had built for the Ashtoreth, blah, 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 these brutally pagan, awful, false gods. Wait a minute, you didn't get rid of those when you were 20 when you started cleaning house? And you read more in the stuff in the temple that's still there. These are vile imagery. And now here's the thing that gets me. And they were built by Solomon. And there were revivals in between the time Solomon built those and Josiah's revival. There was a revival of Asa, there was a revival of Hezekiah, a huge revival. And those survived those revivals. Those revivals were great revivals. But those high places of Solomon stayed there. And I start thinking, I go, what do we do in church that someone, some group or denomination established years ago that's like a high place, and we just say, well, that must be good. Solomon built it. It must be good. And it survives these purges. And you're like, wait a minute. Shine the light on the details. This is wrong. And i got to be brave enough to take down even the high places of Solomon in my life. And then it says, uh, verse 21, he celebrates the Passover. I'll just sum it up. and says, like it had never been celebrated before because they did it by the book. You know, so if we do it by the book, it's, yes, it's better. It's not restrictions, it's freedom. It's better. And then I love verse 24. Furthermore, Josiah got rid of the mediums and spiritists, household gods, idols, and other detestable things seen in Judah and Jerusalem. And I think he's even getting into the houses. He's even getting into the nooks and crannies of the kingdom. And I think you can see the, the parallel I'm going with this. In my life, I, I was, I've been a Christian for as long as I can remember. And I really believe I was. Have been. I was raised in a Christian home, and I know that does not make me a Christian. But I really believe that I had a sense of God's presence, a sense of Christ, who he was, a true sense of the cross and the resurrection that my understanding could understand. And I believe I was saved. And I was a mess. And I said, i got to get rid of some of the mess. So in my own power, I started doing the house cleaning like Josiah. And then I fell in love with the word. I can't explain it. As I was uncovering the rubble, there it was. I should say it better. The word found me is probably a better way to say it. But Jesus says in the Beatitudes, those who hunger and thirst will find. And I was hungering and thirsting. And nothing really changed until I was grabbed by the word. And that's why Jesus says, don't even remove a jot or a tittle 
Don't remove any part of it. Don't form it to your liking like they're trying to do on Palm Sunday. Don't take the kingdom that I am offering and try to make it the kingdom you want because I know better than you. I know better. I know that I'm going to give you, you're, you're looking for this temporary freedom and I'm going to give you an internal and eternal freedom so that when the storms hit, you'll stand. And when you pass from glory to glory, right, you will be with the hope. What he gives you is so much more. And uh, the, the key is salt and light. It has to be who you are. It has to be who you are. Dave gave me permission to tell the story, but um, Dave um, Erickson's wife, Portia, we had the funeral for her a couple weeks ago. And she's from Thailand, and her native language is Thai. She learned English, met Dave, they got married. And uh, when Dave went over to Thailand as she was dying, um, she was with her family, and uh, she was so weak that she couldn't have the strength to speak in English. It was too much mental work to speak in a language she had learned. So she spoke in Thai, and the sister interpreted for Dave. And so he was able to say his goodbyes. And I started thinking about that. There's so much that Dave's story you should listen to it sometimes. It's one of the most incredible stories of God you've ever heard. But I started thinking about that. I started thinking, when, when it hits, we really can only speak the language, our native language. We don't have enough strength to speak the new language. And if you're, new, if, if, if you're not really born again, and the storms hit, you will not have the energy to be a Christian. Do you know what I mean? You have to be a Christian. You have to be filled with his Holy Spirit. That has to be your native language. That has to be your new language. So when the storms hit, you're not like, I'm too weak to do the Christian thing right here. I'm just going to be miserable. I'm too weak to do the Christian thing right here. I'm just going to be bitter. I'm just too weak. I'm going to cave into the addictions temptation. I'm just too weak because it's not my native language. But if it is your native language, if you are truly salt, because salt that's not salt is worthless, if you are truly light, it, Jesus is saying, this will be who you are. That is the kingdom I am promising you. I am not promising Rome is going to be removed. I am promising to change who you are. And I love when God does this, but this morning in the office, God gave me my closing. You guys always think I just wrote my sermon. I did not just write this sermon, okay? And so we print off these bulletins. And, Ruth, and Mike's in the office. Mike Hyde, Pastor Mike's in there with me. And um, Ruth, I go, well, I need to make the inserts. How many bulletins did you print? She goes, she said this in front of two pastors. She goes, well, there were 100, but I lost one. So there's only 99. And at the exact same time, we both say, go look for the one. Go look for the one. You, that's the Bible. I said, you should have never have said that in front of two pastors. We were simultaneously going, that's the gospel. Jesus came to find you. Jesus came, he says, to seek and save that which was lost. And he said, I've come to do my Father's will. And then he said, and I've come to seek and save that which was lost. In other words, the Father's will, God's will, is you. You are, you are that one. Thank you, Ruth, for crinkling up one of these. <laughs> because we think it's my kingdom come, and it's his kingdom come, and his kingdom is you. So ultimately, guess what? It really is about you and your kingdom in the best way that it could ever be. So again, if you're going to be salt and you're going to be light, uh, we need salt and light in this world because people are ripping up pages out of the Bible. And Jesus says, if you do that, condemnation upon you. Because though every page matters. Every word matters. Right? If we're going to be salt. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. And I pray for anyone in here who feels like they're just overwhelmed by the storm. The rain is falling, the wind is blowing, and the water's rising. And their rock isn't a rock. It's sand. And I pray that they give their lives to you right at this moment, that you fill them with your Holy Spirit, and that they become spiritually untouchable, Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Graves into Gardens reminds us that God is a God of restoration. Let's stand and sing.
before you as the one who can turn a grave into a garden. And I pray, Lord, that if there are any, if anyone here just feels dead, that you just show them who you are. And even those who, of us who might feel spiritually dead, Lord, revive us again. Revive us again. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.